What's going on, y'all? It's Jared the Lanyard. Yeah, take you what you need and from Lanyard Legends Podcast. Uh, today on the show, we have Mr. Gregory Carter Esquire. He is the owner of G Carter Law Firm. Welcome to the show, sir. Good evening, bro. How are you feeling this evening? I'm good. I'm good, man. All this bad weather and rain getting to me, but <laughs> the job must be done. <laughs> Don't worry about it, brother. There's going to be plenty of sunny days this summer. Plenty of days you ain't going to be able to go outside. It's so hot out. <laughs> right. I agree with that. <laughs> All right. So uh, so introduce yourself to my uh, podcast listeners. Give a little bio background about yourself. Name is Gregory Carter. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Uh, like you said, I, I run my own law firm, the G. Carter Law Firm here in the city. I've uh, been doing it about 10 years now. Originally from Ohio, born and raised, came here around 2009, 2010. City adopted me, I've been here ever since. Cool. That's what's going on. So, what made you become a lawyer? What made you want to go to college, go four years, then do three years of law school, incur all that debt? Um, <laughs> what made you want to be a attorney? The debt is real, bro. The debt is real. Oh, but, yeah. Um, it is. <laughs> you know, everyone has this this story, this reason why they got uh, into what they do. A lot of lawyers um, come up with this this fantasy idea or this, this great mark in their life that turned them into a lawyer. That wasn't necessarily me. Right? I, I grew up in a small town. Um, I knew all the police officers. I knew all my neighbors. Um, I knew everyone, like the mothers and fathers that I went to school with. Like, it's a real small town, right? But I understood that I was getting a lot of advantages, a lot of breaks that other people who looked just like me weren't getting. Uh, and I knew if, if I stepped out of line, like the police weren't going to arrest me. Right. Like generally the worst they would do for something that I was getting into is like they would call my dad. And I trust me, that was plenty worse enough for me. But like I wasn't going to jail for something like that. Right. And so I understood that advantage that I had. And I didn't think it was fair that people who look just like me, who are coming up in similar circumstances in terms of having their parents in their lives or the amount of money their parents make or what have you, weren't getting those same opportunities. And so I wanted the opportunity to do something to help people who look just like me have the same opportunities, the same fair shakes that I had, right? Because in those run-ins I used to have with the growing up, like if I'd have got arrested, like I never would have became a lawyer, right? And there were people who were looking like who look just like me, who don't have bad hearts, who didn't have bad intentions, right? Who were having, you know, teenage run-ins with the police and ended up getting arrested, ended up in jail, ended up in prison. And these are not individuals who deserve to be there, but they were having their whole futures taken from them. And I didn't think that was fair. And I just wanted to be a part of the solution for that. And becoming a lawyer helped me do that. All right, cool. So uh, walk me through the process of um, um, choosing your major then getting into law school what is the process of getting into law school after getting your bachelor's degree so uh the whole journey to become a lawyer is like a seven year eight year process right you have your four years of undergrad you have your three years of law school but while you're in undergrad is when you start applying to law school and you got to take the lsat and you gotta essentially you know interview your way into these law schools, right? Um, take the LSAT over the summer, you get your score back, and then they have a process where you're going online and submitting personal interest letters and talking to different counselors from these schools and the opportunity to basically sell yourself to this school so they can say, I want this individual as opposed to someone else. Um, and it's a, it's a very strict process. It's a very time consuming process, um, but ultimately, um, you choose a school and hopefully that school chooses you back and that's where you end up. Okay. Um, so what law school did you wind up going selecting? I went to the University of Cincinnati. Okay, cool. And what made you, so when you, at the beginning of law school, because it's very interesting because I always love uh, law and order and uh, cop shows and stuff like that. So when you are in your first year of law school, uh, how is that? How, how did it prepare you? How... <laughs> um, that first year of law school is not nice, bro. It, it's nothing <laughs> nice at all. Uh, it, there's not a whole lot you're doing during that time other than studying, highlighting, going to class, taking notes, 
coming back from class, going to the library, being at the library all night, reading, studying, highlighting, and doing it all over again. And the wild thing about law school is that it's not it's not a day by day process in terms of like you're not getting graded on attendance, right? Like you're not having weekly quizzes, right? Like to build up to the end of the semester. Like you have one exam at the end of the semester, and that's for all the marbles for all, oh, all semester. Right? Really? And so yeah, you can be there in class every day, participating, doing your best. Like the teacher knows, your teacher knows you've been doing all your work. But if you fail that exam, you just fail that exam. Like there ain't no coming back from that, right? And that, the opposite is true as well. Like you can never go to class, right? Show up at your exam at the end of the semester, ace your exam, and keep moving along in the journey, right? And so it all comes down to that that one exam. And I think it's by design, right? They want to build pressure on you, build that stress on you. So you know, should you end up in trial, should you end up in a deposition, what have you, and everything's on the line for that one particular day, that that's not something foreign to you. But that's the way they design it, bro. And it, a lot of people crack under the pressure. Uh, but it's certainly hard, bro. especially your first year. It's difficult. It's not nothing nice. It's not an enjoyable year that you're going through. So, so there's no homework, there's no midterms, there's no group projects and nothing like that in your first year? It, I mean, literally, it's you're getting a reading assignment that they're going to talk about the next day in class, right? And if the teacher calls on you, you're expected to know the answer, right? Mm -hmm. But you're not getting graded on that. Like, it might be the difference if you're right at the line, right, between like failing a pass and or A and A plus. The teacher remembers that you were there all semester answering questions and participating. That might be enough to get you over the line, right? But it's not going to be enough to get you from fail to pass, right, if you just don't do well in that exam. And so... There, there's nothing else. There's no group projects. There's no papers. It's just that one exam at the end. Okay. So how how is it from transitioning from the first year to the second year? What's different from the first and second year? Um, one year a little bit more comfortable, right? Like you've adjusted to it a little bit more. Um, you're more picking your classes and your route that you want to take as opposed to your first year. All your classes are chosen for you, right? Um, and you're able to do a little bit more when you're choosing your own classes, you're in, you're in charge of your schedule, you're in charge of your free time a little bit more, you have more free time to be able to do things like interning um, or uh, working at different offices on different projects. So you have a little bit more time to dive into your own particular interests and become an individual in the field of law as opposed to in the general studies part of it. All right, cool. So in the second year, when do you start the, I guess the trial, I won't say trial run, it's a trial run, trial practice, uh, I guess mock, mock, mock trials, is, that's the right terminology to use? So um, there's there's nothing about law school that necessarily teaches you how to be in a courtroom, right? Okay. There's, unless you take um, that specific class, that trial advocacy class, mm -hmm. right? And it's not it's not a mandated class like every every person in law school, every law student, every lawyer doesn't take that class. Right? you have to choose. You have to opt to take that class. Right. And a lot of times those trial advocacy programs, you have to choose to get in, interview to get in, have to be selected to be a part of that program. Right. And so that can be your second year or that can be your third year. Um, but for me, actually, I was in a mock trial program when I was an undergrad. And that's you know really what kind of sparked the fire for me. Like. Growing up where I grew up, like, I don't know any lawyers. Like, I don't come from a family of lawyers. That's not how my people are. Um, you know, we go to work in the morning, we work our nine to five, our 12 hour shift, and we come home. But right. it's not a professional thing in terms of like my mother and father, you know, grandfather, et cetera. Um, so it was in law school when I was in the mock trial program that I kind of got a, the experience of what to do inside of a courtroom and realized it was actually something I could do, right? It, like, it took actually doing it, stepping out there on my own. Um, to learn that it was something that I could actually do, actually I could perform well in, um, that kind of pushed me that extra step to actually start applying to law schools and get in. And so I learned everything I I know how to do now inside of a courtroom. 95, 99% of that I learned in undergrad. Okay. Really? That's that's interesting. How you why, why would you say that? Because, I mean, everyone learns the law, right? Like, everyone takes that criminal law course, right? Everyone takes criminal procedure, right? And everyone's going to ultimately take a bar exam in their state that they're going to practice in, right? So everyone's equal in, in that regard. But in terms of how to do an opening statement, right? How to 
how to cross-examine someone, when to object, how to object, right? How to give a closing argument, all those kinds of things. I learned all that in undergrad in my mock trial program. Um, and I didn't learn any of that uh, necessarily in law school. Now, I, I did take the trial advocacy program in law school, so I don't want to take anything away from them. Mm -hmm. But I already had those skills going into that program as opposed to learning them for the first time when I got in that program in law school. Okay, cool. All right. So um, so now you're out to second year. So how is it going from the second year to the third year? Since you're the top dog your last year, how does that go? I mean, when you're in your third year, you can see the finish line, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't let off the gas completely, right? But you see the finish line and you're you're working towards where I'm going to be after law school. I mean, that's most of what your third year is, right? It's trying to get that job after law school. And that's what you spend a lot of your time. And you get the, again, this is an opportunity for you to pick your own classes, right? Which seems like a normal thing to do coming in undergrad, you get to pick your own classes. But if you remember that first year of undergrad, most of your classes are chosen for you when you're in a general study program. Um, and so having that freedom in your third year to really like dive deeper into subjects and really dive deeper in the areas that you're interested in or the diving classes that you think you're going to get an A and that's going to bump your GPA up, whatever your preference is, you have that opportunity to do that. But you also have the opportunity to, you know, interview at different places. I was at Cincinnati going to school, but I knew I wasn't going to practice in Ohio. Right. And so I was interviewing all over the country. I was in D.C. interviewing. I was down here in New Orleans interviewing. I was in, you know, name a city on the East Coast. And I was either having phone interviews or physically driving there on off days in school to go interview at these different places. And so it gives you an opportunity with your free time in your third year to really find out what you're going to do for your career. Okay. So you uh, graduate from the third year. Um, um, when did you decide, why did you decide to come to New Orleans of all places in the world to be an attorney? Why New Orleans? It was that same thing for me in terms of I wanted to work with and for people who look just like me, like people who didn't get all the advantages in life, right? People who were kind of given the short end of the stick. Those are the those are my people. Those who I wanted to work for, right? So I wanted to be a public defender. Um, I also knew I didn't want to do it in Ohio because uh, I didn't want to be the family lawyer, right? Like I don't want Uncle John Doe calling me because he got in with Aunt Jane though and they want me to come like write up a divorce for him or one of them got arrested and I gotta represent uncle against I like I don't want to be involved in all that right and so for me I just wanted to get out of Ohio and so I was willing to be a public defender anywhere where I was representing people who looked like me and that wasn't in Ohio and so you know my last two choices came down to DC and New Orleans but you know Philadelphia was on the map uh, I even looked at Alaska for a while, just as, you know, an adventure to get away and to be somewhere else. Um, you know, Miami, Philadelphia, New York, um, you name it, a big city. And I had put an application there. Okay. So um, you graduated from law school and then you become, did, did you start working in a public defense office in New Orleans? Right. And so uh, when it came down to New Orleans and D.C., like my eyes were on D.C., like okay. everything I knew about DC, I loved and I wanted to be a part of. Um, I actually had a mentor who had suggested trying out New Orleans. I interviewed New Orleans. Uh, my first time interviewing was, was actually in DC at a, at a conference. Then I flew down to New Orleans for an interview, um, came home that night, woke up the next morning, was getting ready to drive back to Cincinnati because I had flew into Columbus where my mom was staying at the time. Um, and while I was pumping gas, New Orleans called me and said, look, you got a job if you want, but we just need to know within 48 hours if you're accepting it or not. Um, so I called DC and said, look, I got a job. If y'all don't let me know within 48 hours, I'm going to take it. I didn't hear from DC, so I accepted a New Orleans job. A week after graduating from law school, I was in my car with my dad, and we were driving down here. Um, so I'm here in New Orleans and took the bar exam, working at the public defender's office down here. And you know, for the first couple of years, just grinding it out day to day. OK. All right. So now you're down here. Um, you just moved down. You're working for the public defense office in New Orleans. So how was it? Um, did you take the bar exam as soon as you graduated or you waited a couple? Like, I thought, don't you have, what's the year? Don't you have some time before you can take it? In order to start practicing, you have to take the exam and pass the exam. Right. right. Um, 
I took it initially uh, in the summer of 2009, and I did what's called conditioning, meaning that like there's nine different parts of it. I think you had to pass seven parts of it in order to get your license. Uh, the first time I took it, I passed six, right? And so they're like, we're not going to make you take all nine parts over again, but we're going to make you take, you know, two parts or one part if you do, just to get up to that seventh part and be able to get your license. But they don't let you take it like the next week or a couple of days later. Like you have to wait. I initially took it in July, I think is the summer exam and had to wait again to take it in February for the winter exam. And so I didn't actually get my license until April of 2010. But during that time from essentially May of 2009 to April 2010, I'm still here in New Orleans. So at the public defender's office, I'm working, except I can't go to court and represent clients. So I'm essentially helping other lawyers get stuff together. I'm helping investigators go out, interview witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm still down here on a day-to-day -day basis working. Okay, cool. All right. So um, you're working for the public defender's office. What made you want to start your own law firm? What pushed you that way? Man, I like being able to keep the lights on, bro. Like, <laughs> that, that was it. Um, I like the public defender's office. I like the job. I like the people, right? Um, but it's hard, bro. You go to school for seven years and then, like, you're struggling to keep the lights on. You're struggling to have, you know, food on the table. Like, get your paycheck after you pay all your bills. You got a hundred dollars left to last you for another two weeks. And you're like, it's not what I thought lawyer life was supposed to be. Like I didn't right. expect to be rich and like come out the gate making like piles of money, but I didn't expect to be struggling right off the gate either. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, after a while, you just, you, you want to do a little bit better for yourself for all the work that you're putting in. Right. Um, and another lawyer in the city had came to me, uh, who had seen me in court a few times and was like, look, if you're ever interested in leaving the public defender's office, I got a spot for you over here. Just let me know. We had a conversation about it, and I ended up transitioning over to work with him. Okay. Oh, so you, you went to a law firm. You went in as a partner, or you just started as a regular associate, and then you just... I started, as a, I started as an associate at his office. Um, was there about five years, I guess. Um, working with him, learning from him. Um, and then, you know, at a certain point, you just want to stand on your own two feet and make sure you got it all by yourself. And that's what it was to step out on my own. And been doing that the past three, four years. And that's been it. Okay. All right. So you leave um, your past law firm that you've worked for for a few years and then you used to branch out to your own. So how's that transition like branching out to being your own firm, your own entity? It it's rough a little bit, it's scary a little bit, right? Like mm -hmm. you're the only person in charge of, of keeping the lights on, right? And so all them decisions have a direct consequence to you on a day-to-day -day basis. But also you have that freedom to make those own choices, right? To make the decision if that's the client that you wanna have, right? To make the decision how long you are gonna work each day, right? To make the decision whether I'm gonna close the office down for the week and go on vacation. Like all those decisions are yours, but all mm -hmm. those decisions also have direct consequences, right? And so there's a freedom with it, but there's also a burden with it. I enjoy it personally, um, but there's a lot that comes with that. Okay. All right. So being a um, new law firm, so how did you go ahead and get new clients? Did you just have client, old clients that you've been dealing with before and you just, they came with you? How do you promote yourself? How do you get new clients out? So, so New Orleans is kind of unique, right? It's, um, it's a city, <laughs> but it's also like a town, like neighborhoods are their own individual towns, right? Like each mm -hmm. ward is gonna be like its individual community, right? And so you can't just put up a billboard and expect people to start walking through the door. They'll see you on that billboard and be like, I don't, I don't know that dude. Right? Like he ain't go to high school with me. Like I ain't never right. seen him around here. Like he right. didn't represent my uncle, right? Like I don't know that dude, so I'm not gonna go to him, right? And so you, you're you build, constantly building your name every day you're in court, um, starting at the public defender's office, um differentiating yourself from the expectation that people have like oh i got a public defender they're going to sell me out and then you represent them and you do well for them they're like oh well, you different right and then you're you're working at someone else's law firm and they see you working and you represent them and they're like all right you got it right and then you have your own clients and you're doing well for them and they go tell their people like look you ever get in trouble call carter right call okay. g he's gonna take care of you right and so it's just constantly building your name based off the work that you're doing. But I haven't seen anyone 
myself included, that's been able to just put out a commercial or put up a billboard or start putting their uh, picture up on Instagram that has consistently kept clients coming through the door. Everyone I've seen that's been able to make it has been in there grinding every day in the courthouse. And their, their work has spoke more for them than any ad or advertisement could. Okay. All right. Um, so I do have one weird question, weird question I should say. So if somebody was looking for an attorney, how does one, I guess, look for their success rate or I guess their wins and losses? Is there a website or somewhere you can look in, like a legal website where you see if they, how well they did or you just look in the newspaper to find out how well of attorney they are? So people ask me that, and I think they ask every lawyer that, and lawyers lie about it, right? Like I know lawyers who say like, <laughs> I've never lost a case, and I know that's not true. Like I've seen you lose cases, <clears throat> but wins and losses are different than that to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So from the outside looking in, you say, well, how many cases have you won? How many cases have you lost? You want to know, like, I went to trial, I won, my client walked out not guilty, and he went home to his family. That's a win. If he went to jail, that's a loss, right? But if you go into court and you want a murder charge, for instance, and you face an automatic life sentence and you look if you were to lose that case. Right. But instead of getting that automatic life sentence, the jury comes back with a lesser charge where you do a maximum of five years and you come home. Uh, you just save that dude's life. Right. Instead of him spending the rest of his life in prison and never coming home, he does a maximum of five years and he gets to come home to his family. You literally just save his life. And so that's a win, depending on the circumstances of that case, right? But technically, you lost because your client went to jail, right? So it depends who you're talking to. Your client going to count that as a win, right? Your client's family going to count that as a win. But maybe someone in the audience might count that as a loss because your client didn't immediately go home, right? So there's all kind of gray areas with that to determine what's a win and what's a loss, right? You know if your client going to jail for the rest of his life, that's a loss, like, there ain't no way around that one, right? But what is a win is going to depend on the individual case and the circumstances and what you're actually shooting for going to trial. Like sometimes you're going to trial and you're not telling the jury, look, my client is innocent. Let him go home to his family. You're saying, look, he didn't do what he's charged of. He's, he's guilty of something, but he's not guilty of all that. Find him guilty of A and B, but C and D, that's not him. Don't put that on him, right? And so the argument's different. And so, so there's no website you can go to that's going to say, they got a hundred wins and three losses, right? Like you can Google most lawyers' names or go on NOLA.com, put mm -hmm. their name in there and see what cases they're attached to and see if it's coming up with, with more wins or losses, depending on how you feel about the case, right? But there, but in terms of keeping count, like every lawyer is going to count it a little differently. And so it's hard to ask them what their actual record is. Me personally, I don't keep count, right? Like mm -hmm. I don't have time to sit around <laughs> worrying about how you feel about this case. I got clients in jail. They don't pay me to sit around and count my own wins and losses. Okay. All right. Talking about uh, trial. So have you, how do you select your cases? Like do you, uh, is a hundred percent referral? Um, do you do pro bono work? Um, how, how does that work? Um, yes. And yes. Right. So my clients, However, they would hear about me, whether they look me up on the internet, whether a family member, a friend, or whoever refers them, um, or sometimes an appointment from the court. Sometimes the public defender's office doesn't have the manpower to represent someone on this particular case, so they'll call me and they'll say, Look, we'll front the bill for it if you can represent this person, right? Like, there's all kinds of different ways that people walk through the door. I get the final say in saying whether or not I'm going to represent someone. And so, if I'm talking to the person and what they're saying just doesn't sit right with my spirit, mm -hmm. I tell them, like, look, I don't think I'm the right lawyer for you. I'll give you a list of some other lawyers. You can call them, whoever you feel comfortable with, go with, right? But ultimately, I get the final say. In it. There's some people who may walk in my office, right, and they need help, but they don't have the money, or I just don't think they should have to pay me for me to represent them for something like that. And I'll tell them, look, I got you on this. Don't worry about money. All I need you to do is show up to court and be honest with me. As long as you do those two things, I got you. Right. Okay. So it just depends on the person, depends on the situation. All right. That's cool. All right. So uh, so how do you prepare for a case? Like, what is your strategy? Does it doesn't matter. Um, or before we even go to that. So how do you know? Because I always see this um, when dealing with lawyers or even in movies and TV shows, uh, billable hours. So how do you come up with <laughs> how much you charge somebody per hour? Is it 
doesn't matter what type of case it is. Doesn't matter what the charge is, how long you think it's going to be. How do you get a retainer, stuff like that? I mean, you you get to determine your own worth, right? And so yeah. you can quote yeah. that number at whatever you want it to be, right? But you better be able to cover for whatever number you put up there, right? Like you can charge someone a hundred thousand dollars to represent them, but you better give them a hundred thousand dollars worth of work, right? Okay. And so people can tell pretty quickly if the number that you have suggested to them in order to be hired, whether that's a reasonable number or not. Because most times they've talked to other lawyers, right? They've called other lawyers and got quotes on it, right? And just because mm -hmm. you're the cheapest number doesn't mean they're going to go for you, or just because you're the highest number doesn't mean they're going to go for you. They're going to go with whoever they feel comfortable with, right? And so in terms of determining that number, you determine it based on your own personal worth, on the work that you're going to do, your experience, right? Your success, right? There's sometimes I quote people a number and they're like, look, I can't afford to do that. Or look, I think that's too much. I think you should only charge, you know, $10,000 or you should only charge $2,000. And I tell them, look, that, that's not what I'm charging for this. This is how much it's going to cost. If you're not comfortable paying for that, look, I don't have no problem referring you to someone else. Mm -hmm. Go with them. If they're going to charge you that, go with them and God bless you. I hope it turns out well for you. And hopefully it does, right? But if you want me, this is how much it's going to cost me to walk through the door for that. And sometimes they can do it, sometimes they can. That's just the way the game works. Okay. All right. So, okay, let's say um, somebody hires you. Um, let's say they want you to represent them in court. How does that process go? Like, how do you prepare for your trial? The, a lawyer's favorite answer is it depends. Right? And <laughs> that, that's the best I can tell you about that. It, it, it does depend, right? Like, there's going to be a tremendous difference between what I got to prepare to walk with someone in the court on a disturbing a piece or getting drunk on Bourbon Street, something silly like that, mm. um, and someone on a murder charge, right? right. The amount of hours that's going to go into it, the amount of research I'm going to do into it the amount of scene visits, the amount of witnesses I speak to, uh, you know, all those things depend on the kind of case that I'm doing and how many times I need to do it. I might spend, you know, 100 hours preparing for this this case to go to trial, right? Or I might spend five hours preparing on to go to trial. It depends on the facts of the case and what I need to do to get ready. I don't, there's no limit, there's no cap on the amount of hours that I'll put in. I'm going to keep working on it until I feel confident on it. And then even after I feel confident, I'm going to keep working on it. And so I'm one of those lawyers that will work late at night, wake up early, go back in, work all day. I don't have no problem putting those hours in. Okay. All right. And so I know we all dealing with this uh, pandemic of COVID. Um, so how has that affected your way you practice law now? Do you have to do cases uh, over Zoom or teleconference? Um, do y'all still do in person, depending, I guess, on the type of charge it is? How, how does that work during COVID? I mean, man, when the virus first hit and they shut down the court, I was chilling for a second. I thought I was going <laughs> to get a vacation out of it. Um, but no, like, it, what it, it it affected our ability to have in person, face to face visits with our incarcerated clients. Like, I can't go down to the jail right now, and in certain jails, I can't go down to the jail and sit face to face with my client and have a conversation right now. Uh, because they're just not letting that happen based on the virus, right? Um, there's certain courts that haven't opened up to the point that they let lawyers in the building, right? And so I'll be on my, my iPad in the office having arguments or having conversations with judges about cases over Zoom, right? Uh, there's sometimes that I'll tell a client or a client won't be comfortable coming into the office and so instead of them coming into my office, we're going to do the, the consultation over Zoom or we're going to do it over the telephone. Um, now I'm telling clients that if you come into the office to come talk to me, you need to have a mask on, stuff like that. I mean, the same thing that everyone's doing, we're having to do, we're having to adjust. Um, you know, it's not something any of us could have seen in advance or could have prepared ourselves for. We're all just kind of rolling with the punches, trying to make the best of the situation. All right. So, all right, we're dealing with the pandemic and everything like that. Um, so, we're dealing with a lot of um, police brutality and people are calling for Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. So, what organizations are you a part of that you give back to the community? Because me and you, as I met you, I met you doing a Silverback Society, talking to uh, young brothers in junior high school. So, um, what, 
what what else do you do to give it back? I mean, I think silverback is the most crucial thing that we do, right? Like outside of your individual home where you have direct contact with your own children um, and, and your loved ones inside of your house, I think silverback is the most impactful thing that you can do, right? Um, when you watch these Black Lives Matters rallies, uh, which I support, um, and you hear them say things like defund the police, like this is what they're talking about, right? In New Orleans, the NOPD has a $193 million budget every year. Like mm -hmm. every year they get $193 million, right? And you see us when we go into these schools to go talk to these young men, right? We got 40 young men in the classroom. Like the school doesn't pay us for that, right? They're not providing lunches to the kids when we're in there doing that, right? Like they're not, they don't have their own personal laptops, right? They mm -hmm. don't, the school doesn't have a teacher or two like to spare to sit in the room just to you know kind of overview what we're doing right like 193 million dollars you can't tell me if you just shaved off 25 million from that police budget and put it towards teacher salaries or put it towards making sure each individual kid had their own laptop that they could take home and do their homework or put it towards after school programs right or put it towards you know mental health facilities like those are the kind of things that affect the community. Us going into these schools and talking to these young men, when they may not have a male figure in their life, they may not have a father figure in their life, they may not have a big brother in their life that they're able to learn these things that we're talking to about. Um, they don't have that opportunity. We're providing them an opportunity. We're providing them an escape from the world as it's bearing down on them. And giving the opportunity to teach young people and be on the front end, right? Like police are all reactionary. Like that's all reaction. They're not preventing any crime. They're responding to crime, right? But if we can stop individuals from ever being a part of the system, from ever committing that crime, like that's where the real change is. And so that's the reason to be a part of something like the Silverback Society. And that's why I'm a part of it, right? And that's why I think it's one of the most important things I do. I tell people all the time, like I don't have no problem going out of business. Like if you tell me tomorrow, ain't no one committing crimes anymore, we don't need a criminal defense lawyer. I'm good. I'm like, the Lord is going to bless me enough that I'm going to find something else to do, right? I, I don't need this job so much that I want people to continue committing crime. I'd rather there be no crime than I have to find something else to do. Okay. Um, since you've been practicing law for so long, have you ever um, seen the difference in the sentencing between a person of color and somebody who's white? Have you ever witnessed that or even have a client that was getting given an unfair sentence just because of the color of your skin? I mean, judges aren't going to say it, right? Like, they're not going to say, oh, there's a black dude, he got to go up the road, right? Like, <laughs> right, they, right. They're not going to say that. They know they got to get elected, right? Sometimes you're sitting in there and you just see the way things are going down and, you're, and you can just, you just know, you just know in your spirit that wouldn't happen if he was a different color, right? Like, he wouldn't get the benefit of the doubt if his skin was brown as opposed to white. Or you wouldn't automatically assume that he did what he's being accused of if he had white skin as opposed to brown, right? And sometimes you're able to call those things out and sometimes you just see it and you make a mental note of it. Like I've seen how that judge treated him. I'm gonna keep that in mind and I'm gonna find another way around this, right? Um, you know, just like racism you see everywhere. You might walk into a restaurant and they tell you, oh, you don't meet the dress code. And then you look around a restaurant and see someone who wearing the same exact thing as you. And, you know, you can call them out. They're still not going to let you in the restaurant. You can call them out on it, but they still mm -hmm. not going to let you in. You just make a mental note that I'm not going to eat there no more. Like, I don't like the way I was treated, so I'm not going to I'm not going to be in that facility anymore. Right. And the same kind of thing with judges. You see the way they treat someone you don't think it's right. And you're like, all right, well, I'm not going to fool with that judge on that level anymore. I'm going to go in and do what I got to do and keep it out. OK. All right. So um, um. I'm doing some research on you, and I see you, you did some very big, big cases. Um, you got people of a lot of crimes that they were uh, falsely accused of. Um, so, what case um, do you think was? I, would, I guess you, I would say your best case, or best case that put you either over the top, or you made you realize that yo, this this is what I am. I, I, I'm the man. Like, I guess it would say, get your just mercy on. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're asking me, I don't think I've made it yet, right? Like, I haven't yeah, caught my it. big fish. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm still grinding. I'm still trying to get to that point, right? Um, you would have to ask someone who's seen me in trial, and they, they can let you know which one was my better ones. Uh, okay. I think I try to treat every case the same, right? Like, all these cases um, 
are not just cases. I mean, not just folders, not just files. These are people, right? Like, uh, I met with a mom today who lost her son um, while he was incarcerated. Like, these things matter, right? Uh -huh. And to say that one individual that had to sit in jail for a year that I got him off a of murder case, his case meant more because I was able to take him and try and come home. That he means more to the mother than I was talking to earlier who lost her son uh, while he was incarcerated and never got the opportunity to declare his name. I don't think it's fair to that mother to say something like that, right? Her son matters to me, right? The same way the other son mattered to me. And I met with his mom on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. She would come to my office, if for nothing else, just to talk to me about what she's going through as she's away from her son. And I have those conversations all the time with, you know, mothers who call me or fathers who call me and say that, you know, they're not even necessarily talking about the case per se, right? They're mm -hmm. talking about their son, their daughter that they lost, and they just need someone to talk to about it. And those are the kind of things that keep you going, right? And so I don't think you ever get to a point where you just made it and you can rest on your own laurels, right? As long as people are still hiring, right? Those are still people, right? And those are still families that are going without. Those, and that means something, right? Like no different than a teacher can say, well, you know, that person who just got that Nobel Peace Prize is my student. So these students that I got in front of me today, I'm not going to give them my best because I already got my Nobel Peace Prize student. So I'm not really worried about the 30 young minds in front of me. They're still teaching. They're still grinding. They're still trying to do the best for those young men and women in front of them. And I kind of look at my, my cases, my files, my, my people that I'm representing the same way. I still, every day I go into work, the people that I'm fighting for. And so I haven't gotten to that point where I can just take a vacation, let someone else do all the work. Okay. All right. Respect that. Um, well, I do have a question. So why in some cases it takes somebody even uh, a lot of, like a, almost a year to even get a court case? So why is that? Is it because the type of case they have? Is it a charge or is it money? Is it up to the attorney? Why, why is that? I mean, a year is a long time to sit in jail, right? Especially for something that you're falsely accused of. But I tell my clients all the time, we are gonna get one shot at this, right? And we have one opportunity to put on our best case for, our best case possible. And rushing to get there doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit me either. The police got the opportunity to respond to this crime. They were on the crime scene. They got to take notes. They were spent weeks and months talking to witnesses and putting their case together and getting experts and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then one day they hand over this stack of papers to me and say, this is our case. For me to say a week later that we should be in trial doesn't give my client a fair opportunity to do his own investigation, to find his own witnesses, to find all the holes in it, right? So sometimes it takes that long just to make sure all his rights are protected, to make sure he gets a proper investigation and then make sure that we have prepared the proper defense for him going to trial. And sometimes that takes a couple months. Sometimes that takes a year. Sometimes it takes a couple years, right? But I'd rather it take two and a half years. And then at the end of the day, my client comes home and gets the opportunity to spend every day for the rest of his life with his young daughter, with his young son, raising his family, right? As opposed to rushing in and taking him to trial in a month and then he spends the rest of his life looking at his young son, his young daughter through a video screen in Angola, right? So I'm thinking it's a marathon, not a sprint. At the end of this marathon, I want to win the race as opposed to sprinting and flipping a coin. Okay. All right. I respect that. Yeah. I never, I never even thought about it that way. Um, so can you explain to me, um, let's say a client gets arrested and what is the process, the whole process? You, uh, someone gets arrested. They call you. So what happens next? I guess depending on what type of charge it is. It de again, it depends, right? Um, <laughs> someone come calls me and says, "Look, I think I need a lawyer." And you know, in that screening process, what do you think you need a lawyer for? And sometimes it's, "Did you see the news last night?" Or "Did you hear about this?" Or "Did you hear about that?" I need to talk to you about it. Tell them to come in and see me. They explain what's going on, right? Uh, we talk about how much it's going to cost to represent them, and they sign up on a contract. They sign that contract for me to represent them. From there on out, I'm their lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. They go to court, they go into court with me, right? Every time there's an opportunity for them to speak, they speak and after me. I'm speaking for them. That's what they hired me for. 
right? And so from that point forward, we're working together as a team, but I'm the mouthpiece for the team, right? We, we got investigators that we can have working on your case, right? We got research to do. We got arguments to make. It all depends on where you're at in your particular case. It all depends on what kind of case you have. But that process will be ongoing from the mo first moment you walk in my office until, you know, that that jury is coming back down saying not guilty, you get to go home. Okay. All right. That's what's up. Okay. So, um, you give back a lot with civil back society. So, um, what would you tell somebody that was interested in becoming an attorney? What would you suggest they do? If your heart's in it, um, then go do it, go chase it. Right. Um, my little cousin, I shouldn't call her litter. She's about 25 now, but she's little to me because she was a little girl when we were growing up. Um, she just called me about a week ago and said, you know, I've been watching these protests. I've been watching uh, what's been happening to our people all throughout the country. And I want to do something about it. I think I want to go to law school. And I said, listen, if, if this is not just an emotion that you feel because you're upset and you're angry because you watched this one day, right? But if it's truly in your heart that you want to go to law school, go. Anything I can do to help you, I'm there for you, right? And I say the same thing to anyone else who's interested. If it's in your heart to go to law school, if it's in your heart to help people, like this is truly your passion, then go do it. Um, people who are in it just for the money, like that first year of law school can wash you out, right? Mm. Or you can become a lawyer and go into one of those big firms. And then when you realize that you spend those first couple of years locked in a little office um, with no windows, going through paperwork every day. You might be making a couple hundred thousand dollars, but your life is going to be miserable if your heart's not in it, right? And so if it's what you truly believe in, if it's truly your passion, if anything's truly your passion, you should chase it, right? And the same thing applies to law. Okay. All right, cool. So um, so let me know what was your, I wouldn't say, um, I guess, I always like that my clients uh, <laughs> guess this. What was your biggest mistake and how did you come back from it or overcome it? Um, you know, I'm not perfect, right? Like I, I think mm -hmm. I make mistakes uh in every case, right? Um, which seems like a wild thing to say, but when you go back, once you sit down at the table, right? Like when you have a witness. You get up, get the opportunity to question that witness, and then you sit down. Or if you have an argument, you stand up, you make your argument, and then you sit down. And normally it's about the time that you sit down that you look back at your notes and you realize there was something on your notes that you missed or something dawns on you that, man, I should have said it this way, right? Like, So you're always making little mistakes or, li or critiquing yourself in such a way that you want to correct something, you want to get better. I don't think any lawyer has made it to the point that they're perfect. And I would certainly include myself in the imperfect crowd, right? And so there's times that you ask a question and you realize you get an answer that you didn't like back and you realize, you know, that was a really dumb way to ask that question. Next time mm -hmm. I'm going to word it differently, right? Um, and that, that's just part of being a lawyer. Like I said, there's no book that's going to be able to give you all the questions for you. There's no person that's going to be able to tell you to do it every step of the way. The learning process that you know, unfortunately, you got to fall and scrape your knee a couple of times. Um, and I think that that certainly happened to me. And I think it's happened to every lawyer that you're just growing as you go. And I've made some mistakes. There's certainly things that I think I can have done better. There's trials that I've won that I've been sitting there while the jury was out kicking myself thinking, man, if I'd have just made this argument, I know they would have been back already. I know mm -hmm. if I'd have just put it this way, they would have got what I'm thinking. Right. And really, you know, you talk to a jury afterwards, they're not even thinking about the things you think you should have said or you think you did wrong. They focus on something way over over here that you wasn't focused on that no one was talking about the whole trap, but they picked on because it was their first time hearing it and that stuck out to them. And so, you know, it's just, it's all a learning experience. For me. Okay. So um, why did you choose a criminal defense? Why not become a tax attorney or insurance attorney, technology uh, attorney, why criminal defense? 
it's that same thing for me, that passion, that heart. Like my passion is in helping people, right? Um, when I was in those other classes, when I was in um, corporations class, right? Like I, I didn't, my heart wasn't towards helping a, a Fortune 500 company, right? Mm -hmm. Like my heart wasn't in making sure that they were able to save X amount of dollars every year through tax breaks, as opposed to helping the young black kid who's being targeted because he's a young black kid, right? And so I just followed my heart and followed my passion and that led me directly to criminal defense. Um, there was never anything else that I studied in law school that, you know, sparked the passion in me or sparked the fire in me where I wanted to do that. Okay. Um, I just got a couple more questions. Have you ever been reached your profile while you've been an attorney? If so, how did you resolve the issue? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, in, here in the city, right, um, there was one time I was, I was going to go visit a young lady in, in Lakeview, right, and I'm leaving her house. I walk to my car, turn on my car, um, and I was checking my phone before I pulled off, right, and then the mm -hmm. cops pulled up to me. Um, you know, come up to the car and ask me what I'm doing there, this, that, and the third. I'm like, look, I know I ain't done anything wrong. Can Like, can I help y'all? Like, why are y'all at my window, right? The next mm -hmm. thing I know, I'm getting grilled about, you know, car break-ins in the neighborhood, this, that, and the third. And like, well, we got a lot of reports of teenagers breaking in the car. I'm like, I'm 30 years old. I don't even look like a teenager. Like, what, what teenager has a full beard? Like, you right. have seen the registration <laughs> for my car. What teenager has his own car out here? Right. Like, what, what are you doing right now? Right. But because I was a young black male in Lakeview, they wonder what I'm doing. Here, right. And so they're stopping me and they're grilling me about that. It took him about long enough for him to go back to his car and say, you know, I need you to run the name Gregory Carter for potential, you know, warrants, what have you in the third. And I think someone called him and said, look, I don't think you realize who you got. Go ahead and let him go. That's not <laughs> um, okay. But, you know, the, there's a, when I'm not in court, right? I'm, like I'm not in a shirt and tie every day, right? Okay. If you catch me on on a Saturday, just hanging out with my people or hanging out with a girlfriend, something like that, I'm not in a shirt and tie, right? Like I'm in a pair of J's like anyone else and a t-shirt like anyone else. And if they don't know me, right, they don't think I'm just any other black male walking down the street. Right? Like there's no sign or halo hanging over my head where they say, "Oh, we know he's a lawyer. Leave him alone," right? And mm. so I, I go through the same thing everyone else is going. Now, when I'm getting pulled over for the, for the police or by the police, I don't think, oh, I'm good because I'm a lawyer. Like, mm. they don't really care what business cards I'm showing them. They don't care what IDs I'm showing, right? I guess the same thing anyone else is saying. And, and I'm aware of that, right? Mm. And so, you know, there, there's no passes that I'm getting, unfortunately, um, just because I'm a lawyer. And by the time they figure that out, we way past that in initial interaction anyway. And so I, I got to take the same precautions we all as black men got to take out here. Exactly. Oh, wow. All right. Um, um, thank you for coming on the show. Um, can you let the people know your social media handles, your website? I posted it up. I'm put, put that up here as well. Uh, how they can reach you? Yeah, I mean, you can go to the website. Uh, G. Carter Law Firm. Just Google that. It's going to pop up. GCarterLaw.com. Go on Facebook. Put in Gregory Carter. I should pop up. Uh, type in the G. Carter Law Firm. It'll pop up. Go on Instagram. Uh, put in the extra letter. Um, I'll pop up. Or put in when you see that G. And I'll pop up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. Thank you for giving back to our community, providing legal services free. Uh, is there anything else? Any last words? No, I appreciate you, brother. Like, you stay safe out here, brother. It's my pleasure. All right. Also, I'm going to give you a big shout out for uh, leading our Silverback Society group at our school that we work out at. I learned a lot from you being a leader, running the program, uh, mentoring with other, mentor, co you know, other mentor mentors. And I learned a lot, and I appreciate your time. Team effort, bro. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you. All right, y'all. Thank y'all for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. Lanyard Legends uh, Facebook page. Lanyard Legends on Instagram. 
Um, make sure you go to the website, atlantatech.com. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We out.